Uh, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. I am Scott Ernest, Acting Director for the Office of Construction, Safety and Health at NIOSH. And along with uh, OSHA and CPWR, NIOSH is one of the lead organizers in the national campaign to prevent falls in construction and the associated safety stand down. And I'm pleased to be able to join today's webinar to provide some background on those efforts and to introduce our ANSI Z359 fall protection panel of experts. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that Jessica Bunting from CPWR is online to handle any technical issues that arise. If you're having any problems with WebEx or with your audio, message her in the chat box or send her an email by responding to the WebEx registration or reminder emails. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared with everyone after the event. As you know, falls are consistently the leading cause of construction fatalities. In 2018, falls to a lower level accounted for 320 of 1,008 fatalities in the construction industry. The good news is that this is a drop of 12% from last year, and that gives us hope that the campaign and the stand down are really having an impact. The National Campaign to Prevent Falls in Construction began in 2012 at the request of the Nora Construction Sector Council which helped to develop a social marketing campaign to address the high rates of construction falls. The goal of the campaign was to encourage contractors to better plan for fall prevention, to provide the right fall protection and access equipment, and to train workers. And the safety stand down was added in 2014. The stand down provides an opportunity for contractors to pause work on the job site, to engage workers and focus on fall prevention and protection. A variety of resources for participation are available on the main campaign website, stopconstructionfalls.com, as well as on the OSHA and NIOS web pages. Today's webinar is an example of one type of resource. The recorded video will be posted online and can be used later to help train workers during or around the stand down. We got a lot of great questions during the registration process, and we'll hear responses to those in the first hour of the webinar. Following that, the panel will then spend some time answering live questions. We encourage you to submit those questions in the chat or the Q&A box at any time, and then hang on to the line as we go through them. But if you have to drop off after the hour, you can simply listen to the recording later when Jessica sends it out via email. So now I want to introduce our panel of experts. First is Tom Kramer. He's a principal at LGB Incorporated. He's also the current Z350, Z359 committee chair. Tom will be leading our panel discussion today. We also have Dan Henn, who's Vice President of Operations for Reliance Fall Protection in Deer Park, Texas. He's also the Vice Chair of Z359 Committee and Chair of the Z359-14 Subcommittee. Dan's been manufacturing, developing, and testing fall protection products since 2003. He's got a strong understanding of the fall protection subject matter. We also have Corey Gay. He's a corporate safety director at Wagman Incorporated. Mr. Gay has 23 years of safety experience in heavy civil and general building construction. He served as a volunteer fire, rescue, and EMS service since 1991 with 15 years of active experience and roles as firefighter, EMT, rescue technician, captain and training officer. Mr. Gay also serves as a chair of ACIG's Infrastructure Safety Peer Group and has served as an active end user on the Z359 committee and subcommittees. And then finally, Adam, Adam Rubin is a senior corporate safety manager with Zachary Group in San Antonio, Texas. And he's got 13 years of experience and skills in ISO, 14,001, emergency management, electrical safety, workplace safety, and root cause analysis. Adam's a member of the ANSI Z359 committee, and he serves as a vice chairman of the Z359-14 subcommittee. So, so thank you to all for joining us, and Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction, and thank you, Jessica, and everyone at CPWR for allowing us to uh, share this information today. Uh, it's a topic that all four of us are very, very passionate about, and we appreciate uh, you allowing us this forum to, to talk about something we're passionate about. And, and most importantly, thank you everyone uh, attending for joining us today to, to talk fall protection. Uh, we know that you always have other things that you could be doing with your time, and we appreciate you dedicating 
the next hour plus to this. Uh, one other uh, one, one item as, I, as we get started is I want to give just a brief background on uh, the ANSI Z359 standards. It's, you know, the, the questions we sometimes get are, you know, what's the difference between OSHA and ANSI? And the, the simple item is that uh, OSHA is the, is the federal regulation and obviously their state plan states also. But ANSI is a consensus standard in which subject matter experts from a variety of industries and variety of backgrounds come together and, and help establish what the state of the art uh, should be when it comes to working at heights and, and fall protection. Uh, so there are some slight differences, uh, obviously, between the OSHA regulations and ANSI standards. Uh, the OSHA regulations, uh, you know, reference uh, some of the data from the ANSI standards or, or that are possibly, uh, better said, you know, expanded out in the ANSI Z359 standards. Uh, for example, the snap hook at gate strength that, uh, that a lot of people saw change with a recent uh, subpart DNI in uh, the general industry standard that came out and became effective in January of 2017. That uh, was originally published uh, back in 2007 in ANSI. And items like assessments that are common in the general industry uh, regulations, uh, those are expanded about in the uh, ANSI Z359 standards. So the, the easiest way I can explain you know, how OSHA and ANSI work together is that ANSI goes into a lot more detail when it comes to the testing, when it comes to the program requirements for your fall hazard program. So please consider that as a resource as you're, um, as you're uh, updating your fall protection program. So for, for you know, building on that, uh, some of the ANSI standards that are, uh, that are available are, uh, start with the Z359.1. Now this is different from the legacy Z359.1 standard that it, uh, was initially published back in 1992. It's been significantly updated and, and the significant update really happened back in uh, 2007 when we increased the gate strength to 3,600 pounds and then we reformatted it in 2016 to create the fall protection code that we often reference nowadays. Uh, that standard is available as a free download from the American Society of Safety Professionals website, ASSP.org. So please go there for that and that standard will likely be updated uh, later on this year. Uh, we also have some other uh, non-equipment uh, specific standards that you might think about. And the first one is Z359.2 on the fall protection program. And so how do you as an organization, whether you're construction, whether you're general industry, or whether you're something else, uh, how do you look at best practices and core elements of an effective fall protection program? And Z359.2 is really the answer when it comes to that. And so you should use that as a consideration and uh, uh, ASSP, ASSP believes so much in it that they created a certificate program very specific to, uh, to that standard in which you get not only a copy of the standard, but the course takes you through a gap analysis of your managed fall protection program. Uh, if, if you have a question on that, feel free to ask, but Adam's attended that. Uh, Dan has, has spoken at that before, and I've facilitated many of those courses. Uh, another standard that you might consider is the standard for designing active fall protection systems, that's Z359.6. And then one standard that we'll probably mention a couple times when we're talking about equipment is the Z359.7 standard on uh, conformity assessment of the equipment. And so we'll get into that a little bit more a little bit uh, later as we're talking about how some of the equipment is tested. But keep in mind that that is a uh, uh, standard that's just recently been released and it is available from ASSP. Uh, and then finally, we get into what we call the component-oriented standards. And, and what we mean by that are these standards that I have up on the screen, they, they talk about more of your program or the processes associated with the Z359 standards. But as I move on, now we're going to look at it from what are the components. And when I talk about a component, I'm talking about full body harnesses from Z359.11, connecting components in Z359.2, uh, energy absorbers, energy absorbing lanyards in 0.13, self-retracting devices in 0.14. And so those individual components each have their own standard rather than having them all in one standard. And so while there was some transition when we uh, made that change back uh, moving after uh, 2007, I think people are starting to better understand that it, it's helpful for them to have all those uh, requirements in an individual standard versus having it in just one overall Z359 standard. Now, when we talk about self-retracting devices, it, and there's been several questions uh, addressed on this, and we're gonna get into a lot of those questions, 
Uh, a lot of them deal with foot level tie-offs, and, and sometimes it's referenced to as a leading edge device. Uh, the, the current draft of that uh, of, of the updated standard for Z359.4 is actually moving away from that, and, and around the world they don't necessarily call it a leading edge device. It's more of a, a foot level tie-off. But, uh, but there's some videos that we've embedded in the PowerPoint uh, that, that Dan shared that I'd like for him to just give a little bit of a description about because uh, I think some people see the devices and, and know that they're tested to go over an edge, but, but we really have to challenge ourselves. Are these systems where the worker might st uh, possibly still be injured when using the devices? And so uh, on the ANSI committees, we get uh, the privilege of seeing you know, a lot of different test environments, you know, uh, information that people collect while they're out there in the field. And these are just a couple of examples that uh, Dan shared with us and shared with you to make part of this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this video. We'll go ahead and watch it. And then, Dan, if you could just share, um, uh, you know, 20 or 30 seconds about the video and some, some items that you want to make sure that the attendees leave with. Let me go ahead and hit play here. It should record through there. And uh, you should have access to this video if you download the presentation. So my... my uh, my audio is muted, but you'll see the go through the fall, and then we have the, the fall that's arrested. And then, Dan, could you just share a little bit uh, about your thoughts relative to this video? Yeah, this was produced by another Z359 committee member. <clears throat> and long story short, we get to see a human analog here utilized as a test weight as opposed to the rigid steel we typically use. And it illustrates very clearly the hazards associated with foot level tie off or a leading edge. Uh, fall, as we would be discussing in the context of the standards and the uh, Z359.14 document. Uh, the point of this video and the reason why I like it so much is it clearly demonstrates that just because we have a successful fall arrest doesn't mean it's not going to result in an injury. And uh, quite frankly, the solution to this problem is to elevate our anchorage. Uh, there are a variety of different solutions that could have been uh, utilized here as opposed to strictly tying off at the foot level. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dan. And, and you know, one, one you know, fundamental is just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. And I think that applies here, uh, elevating our anchorage. Uh, just because we, we have devices that have, been go have gone through a test doesn't mean that it's necessarily in the best interest of the worker uh, and the organizations out there. So thanks, Dan. One other video that, again, we'll hit play. No sound on this. Uh, there will be sound in the video that you, if you download the PowerPoint, but uh, let's go ahead and watch this next video. Give me one second, please. And uh, Dan, if you could share a couple words after it. And Dan, first clarify, what was that shooting over to the right hand of the screen uh, at the end of the video, just for clarity? Well, there were, there were two projectiles that you will have seen in that video. The first was the hard hat falling off the worker immediately after the initiating of, of the fall arrest. So we're all wearing the wrong hard hats. If we don't have chin straps to retain those helmets, they're not going to protect us. The second projectile you saw flying off to the right-hand side of the screen at the conclusion of the fall was actually the severed leg of the dummy from the knee down. But this clearly illustrates the hazards of pendulum effect or you know, improper proximity to our anchorage. So we have to look at making sure that we have safe work systems in place. Just having fall protection doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get the result we're looking for. Great. Thanks, Dan. And again, our hope is that uh, the, these uh, videos are obviously very demonstrative when, when showing the use of the fall production equipment. So special thanks, uh, especially for the first one to John Corvo of Lighthouse Safety uh, for making that available. And, uh, and please use these videos during your stand-on activities, helping illustrate that, uh, that just because you're tied off doesn't mean you're safe and you need to think through some of the items that we'll be spending the rest of the hour talking about. So as I move back to the rest of the Z359 component standards, we fill out the, the other uh, aspects of the standards. Uh, we have the single, single anchor lines and fall arresters that used to previously be called vertical lifelines. We have our ladder uh, fall arrest systems. We also have horizontal lifelines, which has the double X indicating that it has not yet been published. Uh, but then finally, we have anchorage connectors at Z359.18. And the, 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 the thought process behind the numbering scheme is we start with the thing that's most important uh, when it comes to our personal fall protection system, and that's the person. And the piece of equipment closest to the person is a harness. 
and then we move our way to the anchorage. And so that's the numbering scheme that we use here for the Z359 standards. Uh, one other item I want to clarify is that uh, the Z359 standards uh, previously applied to only non-construction applications. Uh, about 2007, we removed that exemption, so we've been taking that aspect throughout all the standards to make sure that they are indicating that they apply to construction and non-construction applications, so in essence, all the different industries out there. So if you're, if you're a contractor, you know, the Z359 applies to you. If you're uh, in the general industry or if you're in a, the wholesale industry, whatever industry you're in, please know that the Z359 uh, standards do apply to you and then the scope is, is, is where that is clarified. Uh, so one item just to close out when we talk about our Z359 standards, our, our mission as part of the Z359 Fall Production Committee and, and everyone uh, on the panel here, our, our, our active voices on that committee, is to really create standards to reduce the number and the severity of fall incidents. It's not just uh, the number of fall incidents, and it's not the severity, it's really both of those items. And so as we're thinking about creating the standards, we're constantly challenging each other, how are we doing that? And, and, and Dan brought up a, a great point relative to the first video that we had, is that many times when we're testing the product, we're testing a, a rigid steel weight that's cylindrical in shape. We're not testing a human analog as we did in that. And so that's something that we constantly have to be focused on, that we're not dropping test weights out in the environment. We actually have real people connected to these, and we need to uh, think about them when we're creating the standards associated with that. So with that, we are going to move into the phase of this program in which we're going to go through all the questions, or hopefully all the questions, that, uh, that, you've that you've chatted in uh, up to this point. Uh, when we hit the top of the hour, we're going to reconnect with uh, Jessica on other questions that have been chatted in throughout the hour. But please feel free to reach out to myself, Corey, Dan, Adam, to ask any questions if we can clarify anything. I asked them specifically if we could include our email addresses up here so that we could be a resource uh, for you. Consider us your, your fall protection phone of friends or email a friend. Uh, because we want to make sure that we are there to support you and, and most importantly, to support the workers out there in the field. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and go into our first big topic. We have four big topics and a number of uh, sub-questions, but the first big topics deal with the leading edge devices. And, and this was when I looked through the questions and, and when everyone else looked through the questions, we knew that we had to start here. Uh, but Dan, I'm going to start with you before I move on to uh, Adam and then Corey. Uh, Dan, what are, uh, what are two to three things that everyone should know about leading edge devices uh, before they use them? Dan. Well, first, <clears throat> we can't assure you that they are universally protective. And what I mean by that is this. These devices are tested according to procedures in the point .14 standard in the Z359 code. And those conditions are, you know, uh, executed in a controlled environment under very, very specific circumstances on a specific analog uh, substrate. And if we look at all of the different structural substrates that exist out there in the workplace, uh, there's no way that we could possibly simulate all of those with a single substrate. So my larger concern is that people believe that these devices are suitable for all applications and there are many circumstances where they probably aren't, uh, especially if we look at the different construction methods for these devices. For example, many, uh, will utilize a web constituent or a webbing line, and many of those are highly vulnerable in concrete environments, for example. Uh, the next thing I would say is that they require a considerable amount of clearance. If you look at the uh, manufacturer published data, most of these devices are going to require somewhere between 16 to 20 feet of clearance below the walking working surface uh, to safely, or, well, safely arrest a fall, uh, and that you know, includes objects in the fall path. Uh, and if you go back to the first video where we saw the orange dummy drop, obviously there were obstructions in the fall path and uh, we didn't have a safe outcome. And finally, I'd say uh, in terms of hot button issues, uh, if you are using one of these leading edge devices in that foot level, deck level, anchorage orientation and you take a fall, you are probably going to get hurt. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Adam, if I could switch switch over to you, I, I know that you know in the in the built environment, uh, you're doing a lot. You know, whether it be on the heavy civil side or the industrial side, uh, what is your best practice for dealing with leading edge issues? Uh, 
Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, so, uh, thanks, Tom. I appreciate the question. And, and I think that um, the best the best thing that you can do to kind of alleviate this issue is, um, you know, you, you don't tie off below your dorsal D-ring with the use of an SRL. So that's a commitment that, that my organization has made, and, and uh, you know, we have – we have a number of, of, of struggles or, or conversations around it. Um, but I think that if you, if you elevate your anchorage, as Dan said, you literally make every component of fall protection or fall prevention better. Um, and so by elevating your uh, anchorage above your dorsal D-ring, you never have to worry about the edge coming into play. So you don't have edge issues or leading edge issues. So I think the real challenge is going from using an SRL for everything to saying, hey, in this specific situation, if I don't have an overhead anchorage or, or tie off above, above my dorsal D-ring, maybe an SRL isn't the right application, and I need to think about what, what, what a better fall protection solution looks like. Great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Corey, if I could go on to you, uh, I know that you know in, in recent times you you looked at a variety of manufacturers, uh, different equipment manufacturers that you have on your sites, and uh, and you, you you kind of use that basis as far as how you're going to deal with leading edge issues. Uh, what what can you share uh, relative to how you uh, manage that issue uh, as part of your your work on site? Okay, thanks, Tom. So, no, you're you're exactly right, and I just wanted to comment quickly on on Adam's, um, you know, emphasis on elevating the anchor point because that does um, make every possible outcome better for the end users of fall protection or fall rescue. But um, so so what we did over the past two years is basically went through and started fresh and took a look at our exposures, and we took a look at our work activities and basically developed an in-house. Uh, guide for all of our um, all of our forces to to utilize when they're planning out their work at height. So basically, um, it provides them information on what devices to use in what different applications. Um, because what we found out through our journey basically was that we had over the years accumulated a number of different manufacturers uh, of products, a number of different types of products in our inventory. And um, there was, uh, I hate to say it, but, uh, you know, there was misuse of those products. You know, so an end user uh, in the field may be using the wrong device for the wrong application. And so when we saw that a couple of years ago and really, you know, started to rein it in and look at it more closely, um, you know, we developed that chart, did retraining, um, reinspected all of our gear, took a lot of different devices out of service uh, that we removed from, from our inventory. And... Um, you know, along with that, also mentioned that we, um, you know, at least on our heavy civil side, doing uh, bridge uh, bridge construction work, decided to eliminate all webbing-based products from our inventory, um, just because of the environments we work in. Um, and so we we went ahead and did that. And uh, like I said, the end product was this field user's guide, which provides good, succinct information on which lanyards to use for which different types of work applications. Great, thanks, Corey. Um, yep. Dan, if I could come back to you now, um, you know, just, just with the number of sites that you've been on, just dealing with you know various various uh, customers and so forth, is is leading edge, edge equipment widely used in the construction industry? And, and the reason why I ask that is is when you're out there and you're see, seeing situations where people uh, are at a leading edge application, are they using leading edge equipment? Rated equipment, or are they using non-leading edge rated equipment? What what have, what do you typically see out there? Uh, by and large, it's a it's a very mixed bag, Tom. And you know, yes, there is a tremendous amount of leading edge equipment, uh, both of the you know conventional uh, large unit variety or 20, 30, 50 foot units, but also probably more alarmingly, the personal devices that are you know worn in lieu of an energy absorbing lanyard. And, you know, the, the concern I have prevailing here is that a lot of these products are being used in areas where they shouldn't be. Uh, and because there's a comfort level that's, that's been developed in the end user community with these devices, that foot level tie-off is becoming almost a, a, a default uh, behavior. 
And what most people don't really understand about these devices is that they do not have the same factors of safety as energy absorbing lanyards. And so I think we see a lot of people out there really operating under a false sense of security. Uh, they're absolutely pro prolific, and the, the manner in which these devices are being used varies widely from site to site or from you know, contractor to contractor. And in many cases, they're being intermixed. In other words, I see a lot of uh, leading edge devices being mounted overhead, which is perfectly acceptable and almost applaudable. Uh, but I see a lot of conventional SRLs that are not leading edge rated being used in horizontal applications where there's the potential for that that edge contact to take place. And there's been some high, uh, some high profile fatalities resulting from that behavior. So really understanding your device, its capabilities and its limitations is critical to safe outcomes. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna come to Corey in a second for a comment, Dan, but real quick, I wanna pick an item that you just shared. How does somebody identify whether or not a, a device uh, has been rated according to the, the Z359.14 standard based on the, the leading edge test? Well, first of all, it should be described as a self-retracting lanyard with leading edge capability or an SRL-LE on its labeling. Uh, that would be the first indicator. Uh, you wanna look for the Z359.14 uh, indication on the label as well. Your larger, more conventional units of you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 foot lengths uh, that are intended to be anchored to the structure uh, will feature a supplemental energy absorber at the attachment end hook that would be directly adjacent to the user's dorsal D-ring. Uh, devices of the personal type, which are mounted to the full body harness as opposed to the anchorage, will feature some kind of energy management system at that D-ring connection. And when you say energy management, it could be a tear web thing. It could be some sort of a, a friction break that's internal to the, 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 the housing of the self-retracting device? Correct. That's absolutely true. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, I want to go over to Corey for a quick comment. Corey, you want to jump in with a comment? Yeah. Th thanks, uh, Dana, Tom. So, yeah, just a quick comment. Um, I wanted to, to back up just a second as well and mention, you know, looking at those leading edge issues and those exposures that we have, and we all have them, um, you know, the other thing we did is we challenged ourselves to look at the hierarchy of controls, right? And really start looking at, can we do this work in a different way? Can we potentially build something, um, you know, that's a unit on the ground and then fly it up into place rather than working up in the air at height uh, where you're exposed to that leading edge fall? So that's one thing to look at, right? Uh, the other thing, can we potentially, you know, put engineering controls like guardrail systems or hole covers in place, you know, to eliminate and protect against that fall exposure. You know, and then last but not least, going down to the bottom of the hierarchy of controls, utilizing PPE, which in this case is fall arrest. So, um, you know, once we get down to that level of fall arrest, when we think about it, what redundancies do we have built into the system for human failure? There's not a whole lot, right? So we're really relying on that gear, on that system to work for that person doing that operation. Uh, and we have to really make sure that we have the right equipment for the right application if we were going to do that. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention briefly, um, you know, also to think about fall restraint. So can you develop a system that allows um, a person to get to the location where they need to work, but then not go over the edge? And so if we can do that, we have essentially eliminated that fall exposure um, versus the opposite of relying on the gear to catch you after you go over the edge. So that's what I wanted to add in, Tom. Great, thank you very much, Corey. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, that's one item that I noticed. I, I had an opportunity to go to London to speak at the London Work at Heights uh, seminar uh, in, in July of last year. And that's one thing that I noticed over there uh, that they really have a significantly uh, less use of PPE. They're using other systems to protect the workers, and when they are using PPE, they're using uh, they're using uh, restraint systems versus versus arrest. So thank you very much. So so built into that is is oftentimes a a thought process. I'm going to go to Adam first on this question that that uh, that that SRLs are are automatically safer than lanyards. Adam, I, I know at, at some of the industrial sites that, you, that you're often on, you're challenged by the organizations where they dictate what you can and cannot use. What, what do you do when you look at 
SRLs versus lanyards. Is, is one safer than the other? Um, when somebody dictates to you, you have to use this SRL. What, how, do you, how do you deal with those circumstances, uh, Adam? So I think, so we have numerous, uh, you know, we, so we operate in a, in a construction environment. We also do maintenance and turnarounds. And so um, in a maintenance and turnaround environment, um, typically SRLs are, are easier to use because you have things like structural steel above, above you, so you're, it's easier to get your anchorage above your dorsal D-ring. Um, and, and then vice versa, on a construction site, when you're building the structure, it's not, not, not always as easy, especially in the steel erection and scaffold builder uh, kind of craft. So I think that um, what we do is we spend a lot of time with our customers. When we, we look at this as an opportunity to add value to our customers. It's more than just about building whatever they're, they're paying us to build. It's about adding value to the overall organization. And so we have conversations at all, all, all levels of their, their organization around why um, if, if they if they spec out contractually to us that hey SRLs are the only thing you'll use on this site, um, or or vice versa, right? If they said hey lanyards are the only thing you can use on this site, we we go to them and have conversations at all levels around a comprehensive approach to fall protection and a fit for purpose. So so we we do fall hazard assessments at the front level supervisor level uh, that you know. The fall protection solution is based on the situation, and so we provide many tools in, in the bags of our supervisors to use for fall protection, such as shock absorbing lanyards um, for six foot free fall, shock absorbing lanyards that are rated for up to 12 feet of free fall, uh, SRLs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we just believe in a more comprehensive approach, and our customers, once they hear our conversation, they are compelled to agree with us uh, nine times out of ten, and so um, so that's how that's how we do it. We've gotten over the last year, we've gotten upwards of forty contracts amended, and gotten the you will you shall use an SRL for every fall protection application removed from the contract. So we've been highly successful in in that arena, and uh, and feel like we're we're adding value not only to our customers. Um, but for our employees and then overall for the industry. Great. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so, Dan, if I could circle back on that overall, you know, topic that we, that we started this off with is that some people see that SRLs are safer than lanyards, and sometimes, you know, that, that's almost put in, uh, put in literature that, that SRLs are safer than lanyards. Is that true, or, or if, if not, can you, can you clarify that? I would say this, that if the SRL is mounted overhead and the dorsal D-ring is under the tension of the line as it's trying to retract into the SRL, and we're working within a reasonable cone of access, then the SRL is probably the safest fall arrest device you could possibly choose. When we start uh, lowering that anchorage or using the personal SRLs and choosing anchorages that allow the introduction of a significant amount of free fall, then we get into an area where they become far less safe than lanyards, generally speaking. Uh, all lanyards are built uh, according to the ANSI standard uh, with a 5,000 pound assembly strength and with enough energy capacity to handle either a six or a 12 foot free fall as Adam had just talked about. Um, many SRLs are built you know, to the ANSI Z359.14 standard as it exists today and for conventional SRLs, uh, there are two tests that provide actionable data. There's the dynamic performance test, which is a straight overhead drop, like I described uh, in the safe uh, work access method or mode. And then we have the quote unquote leading edge test in the present standard. Uh, if the SRLs haven't been tested to that leading edge test, uh, there's no way of knowing whether they have the energy of capacity required to handle a significant amount of free fall because the dynamic performance test really isn't a very rigorous event to get through. It doesn't require a great deal of energy management because we really don't fall very far. You know, once we fall, we go directly into the activation zone, the device locks up, and then whatever energy management system is at play goes to work. And so we, we have a, a very short fall arrest distance in that circumstance. Um, so it's really important to communicate with your 
manufacturer of choice and determine what the capabilities of your product of choice are to uh, make sure that you're using them within the correct envelope of performance. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a turn for the conversation. I want to want to maybe make a, a little bit more of a purposeful focus on on positive as far as what do we see out there that that we need to continue to encourage. So I'm going to start with Corey with this question, but but Corey, what 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 most encourages you about work when it comes to fall prevention, fall protection, and maybe I asked it a little differently. Where do you see some substantial work being made in the industry? <clears throat> That's a great question, Tom. So, you know, across the industry, at least within our organization and through the uh, the contractors groups that I work with, um, you know, we, we see a lot of work being done uh, in changing the mindsets of, uh, just like I said before, you know, let's look at the hierarchy of controls, get back to fundamentals, get back to basics. And it was interesting, you know, last year I was doing a training class, um, you know, for about 80, 80 people. And, you know, I asked them, I said, well, you know, when you think about fall protection, uh, how many people think of somebody wearing a harness and being tied off and just about everybody's hand shot up? And I said, now, you know, why is that? And I think part of it is because it's just become the norm in our industry. Um, and I think we just we need to push to go back to the basics and the fundamentals of how else can we solve the fall uh, protection working at height issue. And that's going back to, you know, like I said, you know, elimination, engineering controls, uh, guardrail systems, hole cover, so on and so forth. Absolutely, there are going to be times where fall arrest is is definitely required due to circumstances on a job site. Um, you know, then when we're in that uh, in that realm, let's focus and make sure that we're doing a good evaluation, um, looking at where's our anchor point, what is our fall distance, and then is there an edge involved, and selecting the right device uh, to utilize for that application. So. Um, that, that's what really excites me about it is, is getting getting people refocused and, and educated on uh, really some of the, the dangers maybe that they had um, you know become complacent about um, thinking that hey I've got this fall protection gear it's going to work for me well let's step back and look at it and really say is it going to or not right and at the end of the day that's that's what's really um, you know excited me about this journey. Yeah, someone I respect uh, pretty uh, pretty well in our industry. Uh, he said, you know, I, I used to just look to see if someone's tied off. Now yes. I'm looking to see yes. where they're tied off. You know, what yeah. are they using, and so forth. So great. And, and Adam, Tom, uh, quick comment on that, real quick, and and, and I'll say that you know, ten years ago, uh, even five years ago, uh, in the industry, that was common, right? You know, yeah. somebody tied off, cool, two thumbs up. But now let's look a little bit deeper than that. Great. Adam, if I could switch to you, uh, where, where do you see substantial progress being made when it comes to working at heights? So, um, yeah, I, I think I'll start with the, uh, you know, uh, with the ANSI um, committee. Um, you know, committees, you know, we, we, we write standards, and so it's not, um, you know, it's not as, uh, you know, like being out in the field and, and imp making an impact there, but um, you know what? Just what three, four years ago, when I when I joined the committee as an end user, um, there weren't that many end users on the community on the committee, and it was was largely driven by um, you know by other stakeholders. The majority of them, uh, you know, Tom, if I'm wrong, correct me, please. But um, being manufacturers, and so uh, today I see more and more end users participating in the in the writing of these standards. And really, kind of giving a very healthy check and balance to to the to the manufacturers who are who are doing a fantastic job as well, um, but but really providing a healthy check and balance to ensuring that we have we have um, standards that are good for good for producing and manufacturing equipment, but also good for our folks that are utilizing this equipment out in the field, and. Um, and I, so I, I think that's huge. The other thing is I think that, um, you know, we are gaining quick ground on, you know, uh, outrunning the sales forces um, that make untrue statements about fall protection equipment. I think that uh, we are providing scientific data to our customers, to end users, so on and so forth, that are, out, are starting to outrun these sales forces that, make claims about certain fall protection equipment that just isn't true. And so 
it's nice to see that um, that uh, you know the truth and how equipment is really being being utilized and how it should be utilized is is permeating through the industry at a rapid rate. And I think um, we, we gain ground on this every day. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so, so Adam, I want to take one of the items that that you talked about real real quick there, and and we have a question that I was going to handle later on, but I think it's appropriate. So, so Dan, this question goes to you. Uh, will manufacturers respond to questions about testing their devices in scenarios where contractors expect uh, to them to be used? So, so, in essence, you know, there there's testing that that you can do according to the Z359 standard. And then there's testing that that maybe the manu that that the, that the manufacturer can do according to how it's uh, suggested to use in their uh, in their user manual. But then, will you as a manufacturer, you know, obviously, you know, you can't make it a blanket statement, but do you do testing above and beyond um, if a if a if a uh, specific organization comes to you and says, you know what, we need to use our equipment in this scenario, can you test it in that scenario? What 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 advice is, does that happen? How would they go about doing that, Dan? Well, I would say this: that I think if if a manufacturer is responsible, they have to do that. And what I'm getting at here is, you know, if you go out and you observe work behavior or some kind of um, activity or hazard on a job site that you hadn't anticipated relative to the use of a product or a system and you don't have any data to support that that's a, a, a safe practice, then I think you need to go back and examine that. And I can tell you that on countless occasions, either at a customer's request or based on an observation that kind of frightened me, we've gone back and in sort of a Mythbusters fashion tried to recreate those circumstances and conduct testing to determine whether or not those were safe practices or unsafe practices so we could go back and communicate that okay, we can assure you that everything's going to work out fine, or dear Mr. Customer, would you please stop doing that and let's find a better way to manage this particular hazard activity or task. Um, but it's really contingent upon the customer to have an active relationship with their manufacturer of choice. And uh, you should feel free to ask any question you want answered. And uh, I think a responsible manufacturer is going to give you a thoughtful response. Great. Dan, just one quick follow-up on that uh, before I go back to Adam and Corey. How can companies or end users tell that a declaration of conformity that the uh, fall protection equipment manufacturer provides them actually meets the ANSI standard? You know, we, we always get the, the question, you know, is, 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 there, is there ANSI police out there? And so, uh, so can you answer that? And then I'm going to jump over to, to Adam for a, uh, for a comment. Dan? Now, I'll go back, you know, I could spend an hour and a half talking on this, and you know that, you know, we, and you and I have done that, Tom, but uh, the simple fact of the matter is that you're, if you have a concern uh, about a particular product or uh, a particular application, then ask for data. The Declaration of Conformity is supposed to be evidence that the, the testing has been done, but it's, it's really just a piece of paper. And if we look at the way the... Uh, ISO accreditation process works, they're really not examining whether the laboratory is doing what the Z359 standard expects. They are looking to see if the laboratory is doing what the ISO 17025 standard uh, expects, and that's just a laboratory operations guide for all intents and purposes. So in many cases, the laboratories that are doing this work aren't always catching all of the design requirements or some of the subtleties in the ANSI standard. So sometimes the products aren't completely qualified, if that makes any sense. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, Adam, you had a quick comment that you wanted to jump in on? Yeah, no, I appreciate what Dan said. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of, kind of exclamation point that a little bit. So um, as an end user, right, that has 26,000 people off the ground pretty much every day, um, I would put this out to, to all of the end user community that says, if you go to your manufacturer and ask them for data, testing data either on their ANSI compliance testing or to test equipment for you in a way that you plan to use it, if the, if the response is not, we would love to do that and here's our data, you should really think about are you using the right manufacturer and the right gear. 
Um, I, I think it's absolutely crucial. I can tell you with that that with my with my manufacturer that we use, we have an unbelievable relationship. We test not only the equipment we use, but we test other equipment uh, in their lab. And 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 all data, everything's 100% transparent. I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, so just putting that out to everyone. Really think if if you're not getting a favorable response, then then what is the reason, and should you continue to do business with them? Is is the question that that I would be thinking if I was in your spot. Adam, let me let me follow up just on one one item that you talked about. Obviously, you talked about the size of Zachary and so forth, uh, but somebody typed in a question about the the smaller con. You know, many large contractors get it, and and obviously you you uh, you get it, Adam. But, but sometimes the smaller contractors ignore, overlook, disregard the need for fall, uh, proper fall protection. What can we do as an industry to reach those folks? You know, again, it's sometimes they, they, they just don't know what they don't know. Uh, what, what are you doing uh, to reach those, those, those other folks to, to better educate them, to better share what some of your practices are? So, um, you know, we speaking in forums like this and local chapter meetings and, you know, trying to engage them. But I can tell you that from a subcontractor standpoint, when we have smaller organizations that work for us, we have we, – we bring them in, right? We treat them like they're us. We don't treat them like they're some subcontractor just off there in the corner. And so when we bring small contractors in, we share what we know. We share what we do and say, hey – you have to at least meet or exceed our standard. And so we're finding that as we work, work with smaller contractors in that capacity, that we're, we're bringing them along too and also sharing the information. But, I mean, we, uh, uh, people that know me will know that I'm not really good at being quiet, so I'll, I'll talk to anybody that wants to talk. And, uh, and so I, I think just continuing to share it in all of these various forums that we are, and uh, in reaching everybody, and from a from an aspect of uh, working with a manufacturer, um, that shouldn't matter the size because I will just tell you that these manufacturers they have they have the data. It's easy for them to provide it. They already have it because they're doing it anyways. So um, the size of the contractor and how much fall protection equipment they buy shouldn't have an impact on obtaining the data. Great, Corey. You want to make a quick comment? Yes, thank you. And Adam, you're, you're spot on. So um, two things real quick. One, absolutely ask manufacturers for their data and take a look at how you're using it and make sure that it's going to be, uh, that, you know, how you're using those products are going to be, um, you know, within their testing parameters, right? Um, then the other thing, like Adam mentioned, you know, working with subcontractors, bringing them on board to, to the, uh, you know, to these newer standards, newer things that we're looking at and, and really trying to get them to, um, kind of step up a little bit and and help them along with that process um, has been helpful for us as well. Great. Adam, if I could jump back over to you, uh, thinking about authorized person training, uh, because, you know, uh, we, we've been talking a lot about some specific pieces of equipment. We've been talking about, you know, how do we, you know, what, what's encouraging us about the field, but, but what... Um, uh, how often is, 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 do you train your folks when it comes to the authorized person, the person actually using the equipment, and, and, and what kind of assessments are you doing to make sure that they, uh, they, they take what they have in the, um, you know, in, in the training environment, but they actually apply it out there in the field? Sure. So I think I'll talk about kind of two levels of training that we provide. So. So for everyone, right, all affected personnel working at Heights, um, we provide two hours worth of classroom training, and then we also have a fall protection simulator. And the, the, so this is a doing activity, not just a, a PowerPointing people to death with pictures. Um, and so, so through that fall protection simulator, everyone goes through it on our job sites every quarter, so every 90 days. And... Um, they have to uh, be able to navigate through our fall protection simulator, which incorporates a scaffold, a steel beam, overhead lifeline, beamers, every piece of supplementary fall protection equipment, um, and, and we try to, you know, get as many applications, different different applications in there as possible. So they have to navigate through that device 100% tied off. 
before they're allowed to be issued a harness and, and work on our job sites. That's the Great. that's the user the user approach. And then we have an eight hour supervisor fall protection training, which okay. provides our supervisors with how to do frontline how to do assessments in the field around which fall protection equipment is needed based on the scenario and uh and, and do fall hazard assessments. So that's kind of the varying two levels of affected affected training that we provide, Tom. Great. Corey, can I switch it over to you? Just uh, do you, you know compare and contrast what what other things do you typically do from an assessment standpoint uh, of your workers that are being trained to the authorized person level? Yeah. So excellent answer, Adam. We, we do similar training. We go through uh, both classroom and do hands-on training. And that hands-on training is you know donning the harness, um, you know, inspecting the, the harness, the equipment, um, you know knowing uh, the right devices to use and which applications, showing them how to go through that process. And, and then also, we, we also, we go ahead and take people and suspend them in their harnesses, right? So that they can feel what it's like to be hanging in a harness. And usually that's a, that's a really good experience for people. Um, I encourage anybody that's never done that to, to do that and feel that. Um, just because you'll, you'll learn right away that, you know, that that's not a position you wanna be in for very long. You know, which uh, I don't want to jump ahead to rescue, but, you know, thinking about, okay, if somebody does fall, how are we going to get them down? And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So, um, so yeah, the hands-on, like Adam said, it's, that is so critical. Um, you know, even to just do the entire training in a hands-on fashion, uh, especially with craft workers, uh, super important. So um, that's what I have. Great. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Dan, if I could come over to you, talking about um, talking about you know the uh, some some presentations that we've gotten recently at the ANSI Z359 meeting. Uh, many folks probably know Kathy Dobson from Aberisi. She's a very active person in the American Society of Safety Professionals and in other venues. But uh, but one question that came in, Dan, was what innovations or improvements, if any, are you seeing in personal fall protection equipment designed for female workers? Kathy brought it from more of a, a, a female versus male to more of a body shape type issue is what she summarized with. What, what do you see, where do you see the industry going when it comes to, uh, you know, equipment for uh, specific for female workers or, or addressing uh, broader equip, uh, or body shapes that are out there? I thought you promised not to answer or ask me any difficult questions, Tom. Well, uh, you know what, yeah. you can do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll tell you, First and foremost, you know, a lot of manufacturers have tried to create, you know, harnesses specifically for women. Uh, and, and by and large, they haven't been commercially successful. Uh, in my experience, what I found is that, you know, your more traditional uh, vest and construction style harnesses that feature a, a wide range of, of adjustability that is sized or graded to the individual is usually the best choice. And, and those options are really not that hard to find. Uh, and most manufacturers can provide a harness that will be very, very well suited to the female. It's just going to be a matter of making sure they've ch chosen the correct size and have the correct range of adjustability and that they adjust that harness to accommodate their specific body features and figure. Um, the one thing that is happening, I think, uh, at least at the rulemaking and research level that I'm kind of excited about and you're obviously aware of, is you know taking a look at the effects of fall arrest on the lighter weight workers as more and more women enter the craft and the the workplace uh more traditionally occupied by men you know naturally by and large we're seeing a, a bigger influx of lighter weight persons utilizing this equipment and you know as we know when we get into the the critical the critical element of any personal fall arrest system is going to be the deceleration device, whether it's an energy absorbing lander or an SRL. And it takes a certain amount of force to activate that deceleration mechanism or that energy management system. And if we don't hit it hard enough, then it's not going to go. So the opportunity for higher arresting forces or G loads to be applied to those persons is a, a, a real danger. So uh, we do have a member of the uh, Z359 committee who happens to work for the Department of the U.S. Navy, who has access to some really spectacular uh, laboratory technology out of Pax River, and they're doing a lot of research on G-loading on lighter weight persons, which is being shared with the Z359 committee. 
So, you know, we're actively working toward uh, developing some new solutions and looking at a broader cross-section of, you know, worker uh, types and of, you know, uh, basic system capacities. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we have time for just a couple other questions before we get to the other questions that uh, that, that uh, uh, Jessica has sent me. But uh, one quick question uh, for you, Corey. Uh, does every job with a fall protection anchorage need to have a competent person on site? Uh, yes, I, I, I firmly believe that the answer is yes to that question. Um, you know, remember the definition of a competent person is to you know, be able to identify, recognize, uh, hazards and then make prompt corrective action or a corrective action to those hazards. So um, yes, having somebody that's competent, capable, being able to identify those anchor points. Um, and, and usually that's done, and I'll just share experience from, from how we do things here, is that, that's done through, um, you know, in coordination with our engineering department. So we're, we're looking at, you know, the engineering of not only the, you know, the strength of the material, the anchor itself, um, you know, the loads that could be applied to it, so on and so forth, to make sure that those anchor points are going to be capable of uh, sustaining that, that fall energy. Great. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for, for making it through the first round of questions. We're not done yet, uh, but as we finish off this first section, I want you guys just to uh, share your, your bit of advice on this one last item. It says uh, they, they, they're, they've recently taken over some safety duties. What's a good place to start when it comes to fall protection? Uh, is there a particular class, a reference doc? So Dan, uh, a reference document or something. Dan, I'll start with you, then I'll go to Adam, then I'll go with Corey, and then we'll move over to uh, our other questions. Dan. Well, I'll say three things. Uh, Z359.2 is a spectacular reference that every safety professional should have access to. I firmly believe in that. And then I would like to say, do whatever you can possibly do to elevate your anchorages and then take the time to visualize the outcomes. And the two videos that we showed earlier in this presentation explain exactly why those two very simple principles are critical to uh, safe work outcomes when fall arrest systems are being utilized. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Adam. So I, I also would, would point, from a documentation standpoint, would point you to the, to the ANSI Z359 standard in general. Um, I also would say, I, the, probably the number one thing I would say is that, um, uh, b besides elevate your anchorage, would be to, just to, to be open to all possibilities. Don't, don't, uh, don't buy in or settle because somebody told you something or somebody says says something like, oh, here's the silver bullet for fall protection. Um, be open to a comprehensive uh, approach that is uh, fit for purpose. Great. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Corey, I'll finish up with you. All right, I'll keep it brief. So definitely I'll, I'll echo Adam and Dan with their comments. I believe those comments wholeheartedly. Uh, yeah, there is no silver bullet. I, I, I can tell you from experience, at least from my perspective, going through this the last few years, um, you know, originally thinking, man, there had to be some kind of product out there that could be used in every situation. In fact, the matter is there's not. Uh, so do your homework, research your devices, look at your uh, fall exposures, uh, select devices carefully, ask manufacturers for data, um, and trust but verify your information. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Corey. I'll add one item to that. Uh, uh, a couple of folks mentioned the Z359.2 standard. Uh, the American Society of Safety Professionals has a certificate uh, course specific to managed fall protection. And what it does is it allows you to do a gap analysis of your fall protection program and your fall protection policies and procedures. And, and what that allows you then do is to take that gap analysis and present it to your organization's leadership to say, this is what we need to do moving forward when it comes to uh, affecting our work at height. So that's a very, very high level item uh, that, that'll, that'll take a while to, to get some actionable items. Uh, so on the other end of the spectrum, that the item I will share is, uh, is go into, and I think it was Corey that mentioned, or maybe it was uh, Adam, that mentioned uh, properly fitting a harness and suspending the worker. I, I think that there's uh, three fundamental items uh, that you should do when it comes to anybody that's in a harness is first make sure they get professionally fit in the harness so they know what is right, because if they don't know what's right, how can you expect them to, to, to be right out there in the field? 
uh, do that, uh, uh, that, that simulated suspension uh, that I think Adam mentioned. And the reason why that's important is I want them to, to, to understand what it feels like to be suspended in a harness for the first time about six inches off the ground versus 60 feet in the air. Because the question I often ask is, what is that person going to do if the first time they're suspended is, is 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 feet in the air? And the answer is, I don't know what they're going to do. And, that, and that's bad. That, that's bad because you don't know what, how they're going to react, if they're going to be able to support you. And, uh, and there can be some very, very tragic circumstances because of that. And then, and then finally, consider how to medically evaluate your workers who you are uh, working at height. And, and obviously, this is a very uh, you know, careful situation. You have to be uh, talk to your uh, human resource folks. But, but you need to know that, that just because someone's in a harness, uh, the manufacturer hasn't rated that person in the harness. They've rated the harness for a specific weight but they aren't rating that person in a harness. And so become more educated about that, understand the, the needs for rescue and so forth as you go into that. So with that, we are going to um, move into the, uh, uh, we're gonna move into the second part of this uh, Q&A session. So first off, thank you everyone for, 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 for uh, committing to the first hour. We have a bonus section of, of, of questions that were recently uh, chatted in, so we're going to uh, we're going to move on to those items now. Uh, so the first question that I'm going to go to is, uh, do extensions, and I think, Dan Hen, this, this question is going to be for you, uh, do extensions attach to D-rings, they're calling them pigtails, I think they're calling, I think they're referring to the D-ring extenders, need to be leaning edge tested as well? Dan, I know you can take probably maybe 20 minutes to answer that question, but if you could give me a two or three minute version, That'd be great, and have the person follow up with you if they need more more information. Dan, please. Yes, in in my opinion, and based upon evidence that I have seen and created, uh, D ring extenders should never be used in any application where we are going to make contact with a structural edge on the way down, uh, particularly with uh, a leading edge SRL. Uh, it puts the energy absorber in the wrong position and can compromise it significantly. Uh, we want to make we want to use the shortest assembly possible. D-ring extenders should only be used when we're uh, attached to a device that is anchored well above our back D-ring. Uh, most commonly, I would say with uh, SRLs, for example, on fixed ladders or something of that sort. But uh, beware of D-ring extenders. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I'm going to switch to Adam now. Uh, Adam, what, what do you feel is the greatest barrier to effective fall protection for construction workers? And then, Corey, I'm going to follow up with you on that uh, after Adam answers. I think the greatest barrier is is uh, is kind of maybe some small thinking, right? Is that hey, we want to we want to manage this the easiest way possible. And so, what's the one thing that I can put, you know, my folks in that's going to um, that's going to work for them, you know, 90% of the time up in the up in the you know when they're when they're working at heights, and then you know I'll take the 10% risk on, and so I think you know not not being open to a comprehensive approach, um, being narrow in our thinking, and just saying, hey, I'm going to strap this one thing to their back and let's hope it works out. That's I think that's the number one barrier, and and opening up to saying. We're going to look at every. We're going to have a frontline supervisor. We're going to train them. We're going to have them look at the situations as they happen, and as as the as the work dictates. And then we're going to put them in the best ball protection solution for that. That that's what success looks like for me. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. And and I'm a strong believer in, uh, in 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 reducing, if not eliminating, all the improvised ball protection systems out there. Uh, I, you know, while, while back in the you know, mid-90s uh, when, when, when a lot of this got started, I understood the need for, you know, improvised anchorages and so forth, and, and Z359, uh, you know, used the term uh, non-certified anchorage, but, but the, the requirements are changing for that. Uh, the, the latest release of Z359.2 uh, in 2017 put some significant additional requirements on non-certified anchorages, and, and I would love to see the day that every Every active fall protection system is intentionally designed, said another way, that there are no improvised fall protection systems out there, that we're very intentional, and, and we have engineering controls and management that are put in place to, to, to have those systems out there. 
Corey, I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to you. Uh, what's, the, what's the greatest barrier? Uh, maybe it's not the greatest barrier since Adam took that one, but, but what's another barrier that, uh, that we can share relative to effective fall protection for construction workers? Thanks, Tom. So, you know, it, it, think about the industry as a whole, and, and Adam kind of hit on it, and I believe you did as well when you said about when this all started back in the mid-90s. And I can remember that movement as a young safety professional uh, and, and when the fall protection standard changed, and then all of a sudden we were going out to job sites and saying, look, um, you know, we want you to wear this equipment and, and tie off, and here's what we need to do, right? And, um, you know, the, the amount of resistance and pushback, quite frankly, that we had then, um, you know, was, was enormous. And uh, obviously we've worked through those and uh, called the last 24 years and uh, have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. I mean, obviously when we look at the statistics, um, the unfortunate reality is we have a, a very long way to go yet. So um, I, I think one of the barriers in general across the industry uh, can be a, a resistance to change. And it comes down to, um, you know, to being open-minded, as, as Adam mentioned, um, and saying, look, this is what we need to do. Let's arm ourselves with the, the best information, you know, the best equipment uh, for different applications that, that we can. Because knowing um, what we know today versus what we knew years ago, um, you know, we know we can no longer uh, improvise and just take a three-eighths inch cable with, uh, you know, some Crosby clamps on, you know, three on each end and string that out across a pier cap and say that's our fall protection. Yeah, that, those days are gone, right? Um, because as you mentioned, Tom, the new standards, um, especially as outlined in ANSI, you know, say that that has to meet certain different requirements, be professionally engineered, so forth. So, um, so I think in general, uh, that was a long way of me saying, um, we just need to be open to new ideas and thinking outside the box a little bit. Yep. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Dan, I'm going to come with you, to you in a, in a question in a second, but there's a quick question, a clarification on, on what's something that Corey answered. Um, the, the fall protection competent person, was they, were they required to be on, present while the worker was being done at height or just to develop the plan? And just to answer that question quickly, um, my understanding and, and my review of OSHA is that a competent person has to be on site when an active fall protection system is being used. So some sort of a personal fall protection you need to have a competent person on site to make sure that those systems are being used. They don't necessarily have to be line side right next to the worker, uh, but in several OSHA documents and news releases, uh, I've seen where they, uh, they, they call for that, to, that person to be on site. Uh, Dan, uh, the question that I want to ask you about is, are there any manufacturers uh, that, that allow you or don't allow you to mix personal fall arrest system components from different brands, even if a competent person evaluates their compatibility. So let me, let me reword that a little bit. Uh, can you mix personal fall arrest system components from different brands, maybe just to address it from Reliance or what you know from, from other manufacturers? Dan? Uh, well, in terms of our policy, we, we do allow some mixing and matching, but we'll qualify that under certain circumstances. And there are a small number of uh, things I'd be worried about, for example, on horizontal lifelines, uh, because there's a little bit of a, you know, flexibility in that anchorage. There's potential for ratcheting effects with SRLs of certain types or design. So we had to examine that question a little bit more closely. But by and large, uh, I don't see uh, any reason why uh, brand makes a difference. If you're wearing a brand X harness and you have a brand Y energy absorbing lanyard, there shouldn't be an objection to that. But I would say that uh, it's important that you reach out to your manufacturers of choice and ask them uh, specifically uh, whether they have an objection to what it is you're trying to do because they may or may not be aware of some special factor or some design aspect that could create a lack of compatibility. So please verify that with your manufacturers of choice. Great, and, and my familiarity with that is, is all manufacturers have, will address that in writing for you, so I encourage you to reach out to your manufacturer of choice. If you don't, if you have some trouble getting uh, in touch with your manufacturer of choice, please reach out to, to any one of us. Uh, many of the manufacturers, at least the top manufacturers, um, uh, are represented at the ANSI Z359 committee, and so while we don't necessarily have the, you know, the sales or marketing contact, we do have the the technical managers, people in, in uh, positions like Dan 
at, at the different manufacturers that uh, we can definitely get in touch with and ask that. Um, Corey, I'm sorry, Adam, there's a question that uh, I think is best for you. And then Corey, if you want to add something on this, please let me know. But the question is, is what is the best form of protection being used in the industry for structural iron workers engaged in connecting? And, and just a little note that I want to add into that, Adam, is that, that that's something that um, I, I speak with someone over from the UK on a regular basis. And they often talk about how we just uh, walk steel with a, a choker cable and so forth. And, and they say that, that that's, that's something that's simply not done over in the UK. So we can see kind of an international perspective relative to that. But, but Adam, can you jump in on what is the best form of protection being used in the industry for structural iron workers engaged in connecting? Yes, perfect. So, um, so what the use of, of cheaters or lanyard extensions is, as a common, you know, whether it's four, six, ten foot, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, I know that's a common application. So, so we have uh, we have uh, drastically reduced that slash eliminated that. Uh, what we use in that application is a beam slider, and there is some applications where a beam slider won't work. Thus, if your if your steel has fireproofing on it or or something like that, so um, where 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 a cheater or a lanyard extension could could come into play. But it's important if you're going to use a cheater or lanyard extension that it's sucked up as tight as possible to the beam, that you're not increasing the the uh, the free fall any more that you can. In addition Adam, to that, the, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm go gonna keep going. Go, no, go ahead, so Adam. In, in addition to that, we use a we put all of our steel erectors in a lanyard that is rated for a 12 foot free fall, um, b because uh, we want to make sure that in the event, you know, there's nothing above them and they're tying off at foot level, um, that if they experience a fall, that the forces through the through the harness are are much less than 1,800 pounds um, and, and as less as, as humanly possible. I think the the other the other thing that we do successfully is we do not allow our structural steel workers to um, to walk open steel. Uh, that we must do something called cooning uh, the beam um, when, when, you're when you're talking about open or top steel. So what that looks like is kind of your feet are down in the web and you're just kind of moving yourself along rather than walking the top of the beam. Um, we've, we, we instituted that about seven years ago, um, and we haven't had um, – we haven't had so much as a fall, a worker fall. Not a lot, I'm not talking about a rested fall. I'm talking about a fall in general when we eliminated walking top steel. Yeah, you know that that's an important item that uh, that they talk about. Uh, you know, you, you you've not only have the equipment so that if they do go through the additional free fall. They have equipment that's rated for that additional free fall. But you're you're giving them, you know, you're setting them up for success to, to eliminate the fall by, by doing the cooning and, and so forth. So that's, I appreciate you sharing that. So, uh, Corey, anything to add to that before I move on to something else? No, that was an excellent uh, answer, Adam. So uh, we, we do similar uh, in terms of, um, you know, having personnel doing that, that cooning so that they're actually not walking the steel and then also going with uh, – an energy absorbing lanyard, not an SRL, uh, that's wire rope construction uh, that is uh, designed for that application so that you have that extra energy capacity for a foot level tie off. Great, thanks Corey. Uh, one quick question came in, uh, where can you find the gap analysis that was referred to earlier? Uh, if you Google ASSP for American Society of Safety Professionals Managed Fall Protection uh, Certificate, uh, that'll get you to the course. They have it as an online version, but also a face-to-face -face version coming up in, in uh, I believe, October in Houston. Or you can just email me uh, personally, and I'll, I'll get that information to you. So I just want to check off that question real quick relative to the gap analysis. Uh, let me see. Are there any scientific studies that you know of to provide a time frame as to when suspension syndrome sets in? Uh, let me go ahead and answer that, and then I'll hand it over to... Uh, uh, to Corey and or Adam and see if they have anything at, to add. Uh, so for that, uh, OSHA does have a safety and health information bulletin in which they, uh, in essence, say that if you don't have the worker's feet on the ground within 30 minutes or less, kind of think about the Domino's delivery, 
Uh, if you don't have their feet on the ground within 30 minutes or less, you risk a severe injury or fatality. And, and speaking to one of Scott's uh, uh, colleagues at NIOSH, Nina Turner, I think it was back in the, the, at the Fall Protection Symposium uh, back in Las Vegas in 2008, she presented a paper in which they, uh, they, 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 they did some analysis and they found that if you want a roughly 90 to 95% chance uh, that there's no long-term effect uh, due to suspension, you need to make sure that you have, uh, you have the person's feet on the ground within 11 minutes. If you want a 50% chance, you need to have their feet down in, uh, in 30 minutes. And so uh, just search for Nina Turner, NIOSH, and, and there's some literature out there. And then also the UK's version, the United Kingdom's version of our OSHA, what they call the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, they have a very, very long intensive uh, document on research, I'm sorry, on rescue out there in which they've researched, you know, uh, adjacencies to, to people being suspended in their fall protection equipment, where they go into a lot of detail on the, uh, on the, the medical aspects and so forth. Uh, uh, Paul Seddon over there did a great study. I think he did that with David Thomas great information on suspension uh, uh, syndrome and so forth. Uh, Adam, is there anything that you want to add to that question? I might just say one thing, right, getting back to, to elevating your anchorage. Um, if, if, you, if you're elevating your anchorage and we can always get these anchorages up, especially when you're using an SRL, um, self-rescue will happen eight out of ten times. And so... There, there will, there won't be any chance of suspension trauma in, in that environment. Um, in the, in the event that you have an application where you can't anchor above, I can tell you that what we do is um, from zero to 80 feet, or sorry, zero to 60 feet. We'll keep a, um, we keep a, uh, a man lift, an aerial man lift, tagged out um, in the general area of the work, and it is, it's meant solely for rescue. So if somebody's dangling and they can't self-rescue, um, people go and spring into action immediately, hop in that aerial lift, and within minutes uh, we, we've got them down. So just just something from kind of a, a tactical standpoint that might work or might not in in your particular application. Great, thank you very much, uh, Corey. Anything to add to that? Yes, no, excellent um, answer there, Adam. So in addition to that, uh, you know, we also utilize man lifts, but um, you know, think about, um, you know, the different situations you may have somebody tied off in. And I think as an industry, it's something we all need to improve on is looking at the rescue aspects um, that are that our personnel face out there. So, um, you know, the planning aspect is huge. Um, you know, thinking about, okay, what if I'm working on a barge out in a river or in a bay or some body of water? Um, am I going to be able to get an area lift to that person? Um, you know, then we have height limitations to look at. So, really looking at the logistics of how are we going to get to somebody? And then, you know, thinking about, well, you know, what's the condition of that person going to be in? You know, is, is there a chance that they're going to be unconscious? Um, you know, if that's the case, then we have some different things to think about, um, you know, versus if they're going to be conscious, potentially we could, um, you know, have them self-rescue or deploy a webbing ladder or a wire rope ladder to them that they can potentially climb back up. So those are all things you know, to keep in mind and think about. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention, um, absolutely reach out to your local emergency services, local fire department, local EMS, uh, and, and have the conversation with them. Invite them out to your job sites and, and say, okay, um, here's what we're faced with. If we have somebody go down, um, how are we going to get to them? And, and ask them what their capabilities are. You know, can they assist with the rescue? You may find, depending on where you're working, uh, you know, in a metropolitan area, you'll, pro you'll probably find that the fire department is very well equipped to perform a high angle rescue. However, you go out to a rural area that may be covered by a volunteer department, um, that, that looks a lot different. They may not have the capability, uh, the time frame for response to get qualified personnel and equipment there, maybe, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes or greater. So um, looking at the rescue aspect is, is huge. I know we, we've done a lot to focus on that, um, along with, as Adam mentioned, and everybody else has, elevating anchor points, really. Um, if we're able to keep that anchor point up overhead, um, where that person ends up is going to be at a much more manageable position for us to help them get back up to the level that they fell from. 
Great. Thanks, Corey. Dan, I have a question for you. Uh, th this person chatted in, some of the equipment we use does not meet the declaration of conformity of the ANSI standard. Can we still use this equipment or should we take it out of service? I know there's some, some subjectiveness in that, Dan, but if you could uh, think about that and share an answer, that'd be great. Well, you are in, <clears throat> nobody is under any legal obligation to use equipment that is compliant with the ANSI Z359 code. So uh, it's not necessarily a deal breaker. Uh, my advice to you would be to examine the product very carefully and make sure that it passes all the inspection criteria given to you by the manufacturer. And if you have questions about whether or not it's going to be effective in your application, then most certainly reach out to that manufacturer to provide documentation to you. And if you're not able to get the documentation that satisfies your curiosity, then seek a trusted safety professional or phone a friend and uh, you know, get a little bit of advice in that circumstance. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, one question I'll, I'll take care of, it says, I've seen people using a pipeline as an attachment point. Uh, and Adam, I'll ask you for a follow-up comment uh, just with your work in industrial facilities. That, and then they go on further to say, that doesn't seem right or is, or is there some sort of a rating process people can do to say that's okay? Uh, so first off, um, you know, uh, the Z359.6 standard really provides the, the design guides for an engineer to rate those anchorages and, and create the other documentation because remember, an anchorage is more than just a strong point. You need to make sure that you have the appropriate clearances. You may need to make sure that there's the right equipment associated with it, that there's uh, procedures and that there's training uh, to make sure that it's, it's a, it's a uh, system versus just a, a strong point of attachment. Uh, but getting back to your specific point, we did, a, uh, we did some work for a refinery that had multiple locations. And uh, as part of a, a facilitation session, we asked, what, uh, what, where do you allow people to tie off in pipe racks? Because it's, you know, it's very common you know, in that practice to tie off to a piece of pipe of some type. And some, some of the locations said, you cannot tie off to any pipe and you can only, uh, some said you can, you not only can you tie off, but uh, to the pipes, but you could tie off to some of the structural steel. Whereas some of the organizations said uh, a four inch piece of uh, pipe was okay, as long as it wasn't insulated or used for process. And some, some uh, went even a, a larger size. And the point is, is that unless you analyze that specific location, you really don't have any idea whether or not it's appropriate to be used as an attachment point. And so sometimes I think there are rules of thumbs that we can use to give guidance to the people out there in the field. But, the, but the, again, the day of the improvised anchor point needs to be flowing away. Uh, the, the, the point that, uh, that, that Adam shared as far as, you know, looking at the fall protection system and, and, and when, we're, when we're going to build it, we already have the fall protection system identified and we're, we're, we're able to evaluate and audit against that type of system that we're specifically designing, uh, that's, that, that's the direction that we need to go to. So Adam, would you like to share anything about using a, a pipeline as an attachment point? Sure, so I think that, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago, five years ago, even um, kind of, and this, this is very unscientific, um, by the way, it's just, um, you know, a, a very field, kind of implementation tactic, right, was basically you looked at it and you said, okay, if I can hang my pickup truck off of it, then I can tie off to it. I think that what we're seeing in a lot of the facilities that we work in today is that, uh, and, and I can think, think of three, you know, it's just kind of emerging, is that um, we, we have facilities that we work in where um, all certified anchorages are spray painted red and you cannot put your lanyard, uh, you cannot tie off to something that isn't spray painted red. And so I would say that if it hasn't been properly looked at and, and, and certified as an anchorage in that facility, um, et cetera, then, uh, then I would say, no, you shouldn't tie off to it. The other thing is that you can do a lot of damage to insulation and, and other things that you're gonna, that's gonna cause you rework and thus you know, added exposure so a real kind of strategic approach to what, what we're anchoring to is crucial in, in the training of that frontline supervisor that's saying, hey, when you're doing work in this area, this is where you tie off, is absolutely the way to go. 
Great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Adam, I have one, one question specifically uh, addressed to you, if you could uh, jump in on it. But how should fall protection skill evaluations be conducted during training? Is it on the job? Is it practical task specific approach acceptable? Or is it uh, more of a simulated approach? Can you please expand, extend, expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, no, the, the, the only, the, or the way that I found is, is most valuable is by, by taking the, uh, the assessment and going out in the field and doing them and watching them being done and performing them. So, so our approach uh, on, on the front line uh, supervisor fall hazard assessment is, is it, it's about three hours. So they go and observe other front line supervisors doing two of them, and then they perform two uh, with a mentor and then, and then uh, based on how they do on those two is kind of whether we allow them to continue on. So, so I think in the field, simulated approach um, in a classroom, just going over the assessment form, it's going to get you a, probably a pretty good assessment form at the end of the day, but, but the assessment won't actually be done. The other crucial thing is taking these frontline supervisors and making them go to go up in the structure to the area where the work's being done. Um, if they're filling these out uh, from the ground, uh, mi mission is not being accomplished. Great, thank you very much, Adam. And as we wrap up, uh, getting down near the bottom of the hour, oh, we got another question that just came in. Let me let me get to this real quick. Uh, when dealing with, uh, and Dan, this is this is specifically to you, uh, as tight of an answer as you can give, because we had. Uh, some requests for the encore of the videos uh, once again. When dealing with workers over 350 pounds other than the harness itself, is there special lanyards, SRL, or other fall protection components needed for heavier people? Dan? Yeah, it's important to note that uh, the harness itself, if, if made <clears throat> out of long enough straps, should be sufficiently strong to lift a passenger car off the ground. The, the active component that we're going to be most concerned about, I think, for the heavier weight worker is going to be our, tie, our connecting device, our deceleration device, whether it's our self-retracting lanyard or our energy-absorbing lanyard, and those have to have sufficient energy capacity to deal with the additional mass. I would also state that the elevation of anchorage is absolutely critical when we're talking about workers that you know, exceed the typical 310-pound capacity that's specified in the ANSI standards and OSHA regulations. We want to stop that person's fall as rapidly as we possibly can to prevent the, you know, the creation of energy that's going to take place as they continue to accelerate throughout a longer fall distance. Great. And, and one item I would just leave the, 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 the thought with is just because you have a, um, just because you can put that heavier worker in a harness doesn't mean you should. And, and Adam, did you want to uh, jump in real quick with a, with a follow-up comment? That was it, Tom. Uh, I mean, I agree 100%. I think that over 310 pounds, it should generate a conversation of what is this person's job and do we really need to put them at heights? The other thing to consider is your rescue and making sure that your rescue equipment is built to handle uh, that, that kind of load as well. So um, I, I, think it's, I think it's crucial to not do that blindly just, and just have equipment around uh, there should be a strategy, conversation, all of those other things prior to executing that. Great. Thank you very much, Adam. And uh, on, on behalf of the other panelists, uh, Dan Henn, Adam Rubin, and Corey Gay, thank you very much for participating. I'll put our contact information up at the end, but we had a, a encore request for these videos. But, but thank you again for taking the time today to, uh, to attend this webinar. It's, it's because of you out there asking for sessions like this that we uh, that we do these sorts of things, and thank you very much for the uh, for the questions that sent in. I know we didn't get to all of them, so please feel free to reach out to us if we can address a case-by-case -case basis. And thank you very much for uh, for allowing us to present in this unusual way by just going through the questions and answers. And finally, thank you very much for uh, for Jessica, uh, Chris, and the team over at uh, CPWR for their uh, their uh, organization for this. And then finally, uh, thank you very much uh, to Scott and all the folks over at NIOSH for everything that you do to keep us safe and to keep pushing the envelope as far as research and information that's needed to protect our workers, especially those at height. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and play these videos one more time. And uh, 
and then we'll finish up and have our contact information. But thank you again for attending. And uh, if I could just uh, chime in for a minute, I just want to thank each of the panelists. I want to thank Tom Kramer, Dan Henn, Corey Gay, and Adam Rubin for just a wonderful webinar. just want to thank all the uh, folks that called in and uh, participated. And I want to re remind everybody that uh, the Falls Prevention Campaign is coming up in the stand down May 4th through 8th. I want to encourage everybody to get involved in that. And also want to remind everybody to look for the uh, recording that will be coming from uh, Jessica in the next several days. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Everyone have a great rest of the day, and please be safe out there. Thanks, all. Thanks, all. Stay safe. <laughs>